Uh, so hi everyone, my name is Dalia Gartzman. I'm an algorithm researcher in VIA, and I want to talk to you today about offline solutions to online problems. And what do I mean when I say offline solutions to online problems? So I'm going to first talk about what is the online problem. So let's imagine a really fun future where we have VIA service here in Tel Aviv, and I want to get from my Frischmann apartment to my VIA office. So I open the app, I book a ride, and then quite quickly, a car will come and pick me up. But then what happens if a few minutes later, another person orders another ride, which is quite similar to mine. And as we said, um, VIA is a ride sharing service. So this for me, as someone who looks at the data quite often, this looks like a ride that could be shared. But then maybe the other person who booked this ride booked it too far ahead in the future uh, when the car was maybe already here. And if this was the only car on the road this day in my invented simulation, then the other person will not be able to use VIA to get to work and they will be very sad. And now you laugh because it's Star Wars. <laughs> And it's Star Wars themed, but don't worry, no spoilers for the new movie, so everyone can relax. Um, so this was the online part. An, a person wants to get from point A to point B, they book a ride, they get a ride, they either get a ride or don't get a ride, and then they get to where they want to go. But what if I had a kind of oracle that told me in advance of all the rides that were going to happen? So let's say this oracle told me in advance that these two rides would happen at 8.07 and 8.12. Then I would have been able to calculate my route in advance and make it so that everyone can ride together and uh, be happy and have less cars on the road and everyone can get to work. So what is our motivation in this project? Um, we have an online problem in VIA and in other domains, I guess, as well, where uh, we have individual actions of people who want to make uh, individual actions. And on the other side, if we take a step back and we look at the, all of the data that we have, uh, then we can... Uh, like get a broader perspective and we have kind of uh, when we look at the data points one by one we can only see the data point itself but when we look at the data as a whole then we can see the complexity and the patterns and make smarter decisions like in this point where I can group people together more smartly more uh, intelligently or something so what is it good for looking at everything at the same time uh, so my goal today is to convince you that it's good, and I'm going to do that in three steps. Uh, first, I'm going to uh, kind of overview the algorithm that we used for the offline solution. Then I'm going to spend a moment about NetworkX, which is a Python package that I used when I was working on this project, and I discovered some fun stuff about that I would like to share with you. And then we're going to do some fun data exploration to see what happened with the results of the project. So how did we do it? Uh, well, first we did a literature survey. There is a, a lot of research going on around the world about multi-agent traveling salesperson problem and assignment and scheduling and all kinds of fancy algorithms. And uh, so this was a lot of inspiration for us to see that there's a lot of, a lot of research going on and a lot of interest in this kind of problems. And uh, just an off-topic note, so uh, probably you know this, that you do a, a literature survey and then you start reading about crazy stuff. So I ended up reading about how um, worms, where they forage, they... Uh, make up a multi-agent system. I don't know, I, I have no idea what I read, but now I can put a picture of Jabba the Hutt and uh, continue to the main part. So really, how did we do it? Uh, so I'm building a graph where on the left side, I have the rides that I know are going to happen. And on the right side, I have the vans that are cu currently on the system. So we said that what we're doing is we're trying to assign cars to people so we can pick them up. But remember, VIA is a ride-sharing service. So I don't want to connect edges between cars and people. I actually want to connect edges between cars and kind of clusters of people that can ride together. Because as we saw before, maybe two people can, have, can share a ride, 
but not everyone can. So I have these um, uh, orange edges uh, or multi edges or clusters, whatever, of people that can ride together. And actually what I want to do is connect edges between the cars and the clusters of rides. Now this looks a bit messy, so let me kind of arrange it a bit. So I'm adding a middle layer. The middle layer contains all the rides that can uh, share. So obviously each person can ride by themselves and maybe one and two can share a ride and one and three and two and three and three and four, but maybe two and four cannot share a ride, so they won't be in my middle layer. So on the left side we have rides, on the middle side we have clusters of rides, and on the right side we have the vans. So I'm gonna connect edges between each ride and every cluster that contains the ride. I'm gonna do that for all my rides. And then I'm gonna connect vans with the clusters that they can pick up. Now, what, I'm almost falling. Uh, now, why isn't a van connected to all the clusters? Where that can, have, uh, that can happen for many reasons, such as location and time. And also about some features of the system, because let's say number four is a rider that is riding in a wheelchair. And as we can see here, the first car is very non-wheelchair friendly, so I cannot connect the edge. So I'm gonna do that now for all the cars and connect the edges between the cars and the clusters that they can pick up. And the last step is, remember, I wanna pick up the people on the left side of the graph, and the middle side is kind of my, uh, my helper uh, layer that helps me connect cars to rides. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna apply an exact cover algorithm. It's just a fancy name for saying, I basically just want cars to pick up uh, as many people as I can. So to sum up this part, how did we uh, solve the offline algorithm? We assume that in advance we have all the requests that of, of the rides that people that want to use the service, let's say today or this morning or this hour. So I'm taking all the requests that I have and I have all the vans that are currently in the system and I'm building a three-sided graph. Uh, sorry, so I'm starting by clustering the rides uh, that can uh, share the ride and then I'm going to build the three-sided graph and then I find the exact cover. Um, so I think I have some time to uh, insert questions during my talk. So if anyone wants to barge in, yes. Where do you address the number of seats in the car? Uh, so I just uh, insert like um, a constraint. So I just have a constraint on the graph that says this car can pick up up to this many people at the same time. Uh, the question was how do I address the problem of number of seats in the right? Yeah, thank you. Yes. Yeah, so the question was, how do I address the fact that uh, my motives as the VIA uh, developer, algorithm researcher, whatever, and the writer are different because the writer wants to get ASAP from A to B, and I want to get everyone ASAP from A to B. So that's an interesting question, um, which there is no one answer for. <laughs> this is a trade-off that we like daily have to answer for and change the algorithm constantly. Yeah, you had a question? Well, it's kind of the same, but okay. yeah, you're focusing on the where do you pick them up, but it's not about where do you drop them. Uh, it's, a, it's kind of all inside. It's, it's in the same co component. Yeah. What's the offline <laughs> part of this? The fact that I have all the data in advance. In the online, so, uh, what's the offline was the question. So in the online scenario, I get one request and now I need to find a car to pick them up. I get another request two minutes later or three seconds later. And I have to answer for every reply, at the, uh, for every request at the time that it was requested. And here I assume that I have, or not assume, but I use the fact that I have all the requests in advance. Yeah. How do you read the clusters? Yes, like possible now? Um, let's just say that, uh, in short, this is a, this is going to be a long answer, so I'm not going <laughs> to answer it completely. The an the question was, how do I cluster the rise? So this is a very difficult task and unfortunately, unfortunately, I don't have time enough to talk about it today, but it was, uh, for me, one of the most exciting parts of the algorithm. I'm just going to say in short that we check 
and then we see. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't have a short answer for that. <laughs> um, more questions? Yeah. Yeah, so the question about was about the time performance or the complexity performance of the algorithm uh, because the middle layer of the clusters has can potentially grow exponentially. So this is one of the reasons that clustering the rides was one of the most exciting parts of the algorithm. And uh, well, that's a trade-off that we have to consider when we work on this algorithm. So, so before you actually start, so every, every node in the left my short answer for this would be I just try some uh, sizes of data sets and see what I can handle and work constantly on improving the algorithm. Yeah, so the question was uh, about if I understand correctly, so what I'm using here is past data, and so I'm not talking about future data yet. I'm going to talk about it a little bit more. Yes. <laughs> Last one. Uh, yeah, so the comment was that maybe the middle layer doesn't grow exponentially because of the uh, constraints that I have of the system. This is quite correct. Um, this is most of the time correct. Uh, but then sometimes uh, for other constraints in the system, it blows up and then you run a simulation and you come back in the morning and you look at the same line that hasn't been completed yet. So I'm going to continue to my network X part. And um, yeah, sorry. So I'm going to continue to my pi data part. This was the algorithm part, sorry, it took so long. Uh, so I'm going to talk about network X. This is a Python part of my talk and about the data exploration of the results. Uh, so network X was a package that I used to uh, build this graph and to do some stuff on it. Uh, this is pretty much the code I used. You can take a picture. I'm going to, yeah, just, just kidding. Uh, let's uh, look a bit closely. So I import network, network X as an X, just a convention. And what I'm going to show you now is a function that I built that takes as input, we said, the left side, which is the requests, and the right side, which is the vans. And then I build the graph, the three-sided graph that we saw. So the first thing I want to comment about Network X is that uh, it allows use for of lists. And uh, this is really convenient as a Python user. I really love lists because they allow me to use list comprehension. And that's a really fun feature for me in Python. It just makes everything so much more readable and easy to use. And the core code is pretty lean. So I have a uh, uh, list, so I can use list comprehension. So I can take the request and build the left side of the graph. And the fact that I can use list comprehension allows me to also use um, outside function uh, to outsource my, um, I call it like the, like the logical part of my code. So we talked about getting the clusters, which is a really complicated problem. And now I don't have to include it in the core code of building my graph. I don't have to uh, like mess it up with all kind of, uh, yeah, anyway. So it's really comfortable. I really love this feature. And it lets me uh, build a graph really easily. So just with one line, I can build the middle layer, which is like 50% of my algorithm. And I can do the same. Uh, we said um, list comprehension. So I build the graph. I build the edges as well. Everything works with lists, so it's very easy. And I build everything in the graph. And I think that's it. And then uh, when I was building this uh, this component in my algorithm, then I wanted to have I wanted to see the graph, you know, like uh, for debugging or maybe showing the middle output for some colleagues that I want to talk to them about my algorithm. And I thought that I could just get like G dot draw and I would get like automatically I would get this beautiful graph. And I even kind of expected Network X to understand that this is a three layered graph. Uh, sadly, I was wrong. And this is what I got, which is totally unhelpful. And I start looking for, uh, for solutions. So there are many packages and tools that allows me to take my network X uh, output and turn it into a beautiful graph with all kinds of features and interactive and blah, blah, blah. 
Uh, for me, that wasn't uh, my goal. I just wanted something that could give me a beautiful graph and no sweat. And I didn't want to learn like three, four days now a new tool just for my debugging purposes. So I did some digging and I found a feature called position. So the idea is, again, I'm using um, uh, like dict comprehension. So I'm using a dictionary to map my nodes to uh, points in the plane. And then I can tell the position uh, argument uh, that this is a three-sided graph. Now I only have to position the nodes and everything else happens automatically. And so I position all my nodes for three layers and now everything is okay and order is restored to the galaxy. <laughs> <laughs> so in short, NetworkX, I hope I showed you some new features about using list, which allows us to use list comprehension, which allows us to outsource the logical part of our code to make the core code of building the graph more lean and uh, comfortable and easy to read and use position for easy drawing because we don't want to work on learning new tools when we don't have to, even though it's really fun, but sometimes there's just, there's just no time. So off to the third and last part of my talk, the data exploration. So I want to share with you some results that we had uh, of this uh, project. And I want to share with you some uh, fun stuff that we learned from it. So data exploration for many people means different things. So for me, when I talk today on this stage, on this project, when I say data exploration, I just mean translating data in, into information. Um, I was told I should replace it to wisdom or knowledge, but it doesn't rhyme. So you get my context, right? Um, so translating data to information. I'm taking the output of my algorithm and I'm trying to understand what do I see here? Like this is just data points, what do I see inside? So my first example, I'm taking here um, actual requests that happened uh, uh, that people uh, ask for a ride and I download the requests and use them, I call it a scenario. So in the scenario, I have actual requests by actual people that want to book a ride in a city. And I use two different algorithms. One algorithm, which I call the online algorithm, is a simulation that really simulates the online algorithm that we have in VIA. And I just run it offline, but it simulates the online property of reading each request when it's, uh, uh, I don't know, when it's in the system. And I have the offline algorithm, which is what I showed you today, uh, that takes all the requests at the same time and sees how, it, how they can match the uh, cars to the people better. So what do we see here? I had three scenarios, one where I had three vans in the system, five vans and seven vans. So we see I'm undersupplied. I can't always pick up all the people that I wanna pick up. And uh, gladly, I didn't do something really wrong. So the offline algorithm is smarter than the online algorithm, which is uh, kind of, uh, it's relaxing to see that uh, it has some value. But now, um, what can I see from here? So I see that there are, even when I have seven vans, uh, which I'm still undersupplied. So what do I do in a situation in real time, like in VIA, that we have actual, met de uh, unmet demand when there are actually people who book a ride and I can't find a van to come and pick them up. So what do I do? So what is the information that I can uh, extract from this chart? So uh, we said that let's, okay, let's think about it like this. So I have the pie of all the people that booked a ride in this scenario. It was, I think it was like a morning in one of the cities in New York and not one of the cities in New York, one of the cities that VIA operates in. <laughs> um, New York has more cities. New York has cities? Uh, <laughs> Tel Aviv. So um, there are there is a portion of the pie of people that we were not able, in the simulation, uh, we were not able to uh, book them a ride. So what can I learn from this? So I, th I think about it in the following sense. I think that if I could convince a portion of my users to pre-book the rides, 
then maybe I could take take this portion of people that uh, pre-booked the ride, which means that I know in advance of uh, the time and location of the request. And for this portion of, for this portion of the pie of the people that pre-booked the ride, I can use the offline algorithm and increase uh, the entire percent, uh, piece of the pie of people that I can serve. And this is kind of a business intel, uh, kind of out of the box. Um, and this is actually a trend that's going on right now in the transportation business. I, I don't know if you use uh, taxis, I use taxis quite often. And for some, uh, for some apps, uh, if I wanna pre-book my ride, then I have to pay an extra fee. And what we see here is that maybe I should encourage my users the other way around. Maybe I should encourage them to pre-book the ride and not find them for that. So that's like a, one happy thing that we have from this, uh, from this simulation. Next one. So what we see here is a graph of the time of day. So this is a morning, we said. And these are uh, waiting time in minutes. So all of, the ra of, all of the requests that happened between 7 and 8 o'clock, this is the average uh, time they waited for the car. And so this is pretty much, I would say, the rush hour. And I look at this graph and I see on the left side, like just before the rush hour, the blue line, which represents the offline algorithm, it gives, uh, it only picks up requests that have a short waiting time. So I look at this and I think, wait, this isn't happening like during the rush hour. It's not like it's just better. It actually does something different. So I look at these results and I think maybe like an kind of an actionable insight that if just before rush hour, I have a request that takes me away from the center of action or from where the rush hour is going to be, maybe I can just insert like a, t a toggle in the algorithm and say, just don't go far away from the center of action just before rush hour. And the third, uh, third and last uh, insight that I have, uh, so this is the, the same graph, this is rush hour, and this is the detour. So why do I uh, keep mind of detour? We said VI is a ride sharing app. So maybe some, uh, uh, the car comes and picks me up, but then I don't go directly to my destination. I do a small detour because I want to pick up other people or maybe someone else did a, pick a, did a detour so they can pick me up or something like that. And I look at this graph and I see, okay, so there's a kind of, I would say a correlation. Let's not say causation, but there's a correlation between uh, between shorter detours and the offline algorithm that manages to pick up more people. Now, I look at this and I honestly don't really know what to tell you because if we uh, tell the, like, the online algorithm, just don't make large detours, then it picks up less people because it's not able to do the detour to pick up more people. And it's kind of confusing. And it's not like I can look at it and, OK, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to fix my algorithm. What I see in this chart is that this gives me another uh, place to explore. Like I look at this and I say, OK, this is, this is my next research. I'm going to see what's going on here. And uh, this is a, <laughs> a really fun part for me. Like give you the, what is my next move? Like, OK, I got that. I got that. What is the offline algorithm gives me? that is not like straight out, the, out of the box. What is the next research that I can do? Uh, so to sum up the data exploration part, uh, which uh, I hope that I convinced you that uh, doing al offline algorithms is interesting and uh, informative. So first we saw that we can get business intel out of the box. We saw also that we have actionable, actionable insights that we can insert to our algorithm. algorithm. And we also saw that uh, there are always places to drill further down and to continue the research. Uh, so this brings me to my take home message, which is that uh, while doing this project, it's, uh, it takes a lot of resources and it takes patience and it also takes creativity. And for me, it was really fun, um, uh, but mostly it takes resources. <laughs> So I really hope that I convinced you today that uh, putting the effort for those resources uh, could have a lot of uh, insights and gain and that uh, 
I hope we, uh, we all have the resources and the energy and the excitement to take a step back and look at the online problems that we're dealing with daily and look at the big picture and see what insights we can gain uh, from, take, from looking at the big picture. Uh, so I wish you all a wonderful exploration and thank you for listening. Anyone has any further questions? I think I can have like two, three minutes. Yeah. Uh, the question was, how do I get the data? So it's, I can just download the data that if we had, let's say we had VIA today uh, in Tel Aviv. So I could go home right now, not right now, but maybe tomorrow morning uh, and download all the requests that happened today in Tel Aviv and then apply the algorithm and see, no, for today, that's the idea, that I take requests that already happened and then I apply the algorithm for requests that already happened and see what happened. What is the difference between the performance of the simulation of the offline algorithm and the simulation of the online algorithm? So the question was, can the algorithm change its mind? And the idea here, here is that I have all the data in advance, so I don't have to change my mind. Ah, in the online algorithm. Uh, I don't know. I'm not sure how I'm supposed to answer that. The online algorithm, can it change its mind? Like, yeah, because, but imagine I pick you up and then... Uh, imagine that uh, I want to book a ride and I get a confirmation. And afterwards, if, yeah. if more people are joining a different... So I'm going to answer uh, during the break. Uh, the short answer would be that if I already picked you up, then I can't really change my mind. And... Let's talk about it on the break. So thank you, everyone.